<laughs> Thanks, Justin. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi! Wow, what a crew. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's such a delight to be here with you all this afternoon. And I was just saying to those guys, after lunch is the best time slot. Like, it's, this is a home run for me. It's so easy. You're all happy. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really delighted to be here. I also want to acknowledge that we're meeting on Gadigal land today and to extend respect to elders past and present of the Eora Nation. Uh, when I got asked to be a part of this session, I was so delighted because I feel like this is my, the story of my life, basically. Uh, I feel like it's something that really resonated with me so deeply because I've had the kind of career that has, you know, that doesn't really make that much sense on paper. Uh, I started out studying journalism and law, uh, then I became uh, a magazine editor and worked in the creative industries and worked in supporting young creatives through mentorship programs like the Quantum Spirit of Youth Awards. Then I helped establish Vivid Sydney and I ran the Vivid Ideas component, the creative industries component of Vivid for nine years. And then I got elected into local government in 2016 and people were like, what? Why? Now? Save it for retirement. What are you doing? Uh, and, and for me, it kind of made sense only because I had uh, something that is kind of wanky and pretentious, which is a mission statement for my whole career, right? So companies have visions and mission statements, but people don't usually have mission statements. And, and I did. My mission statement was to transition Australia from the extractive to the knowledge and creative economy, right? And, and still my mission statement. But how I get there? can change, and it does change. Kind of every 10 years, I find myself doing kind of this radical personal pivot into a totally different domain of, of work and influence. And it can be really scary to be about to make that leap and about to make that jump or to go into something where the learning curve is actually a straight line pointing up. But it's so good for you, for your brain, and it's such a great skill set that you bring to the next thing that you're going to do. You know, I really feel for careers advisors or guidance counselors, right? Like, it's an impossible job when we live in such a dramatically and dynamically changing world, but it's also this impossible expectation we put on young people, right, that, that they have to decide at 18, uh, like, what they're going to do and how they're going to have impact in the rest of their lives. It's impossible. So the reason this session is so great is that we're going to talk to people who have been brave, who've made those big, bold leaps. They've backed themselves. And because of that, they've been able to draw from this diverse spectrum of life experience and, and different domains of knowledge and to apply that in radically different contexts. Uh, it's, it's an extraordinary bunch of people, so I'm really excited to introduce you to all of them. I want to remind you as well that we'll be taking your questions really soon. We're going to hear from Kate, Sam and Mary. And then if you can please submit your questions via Slido, I'll come to them very, very shortly. So let's kick off with Kate. Now, who here has had a loon croissant? Oh my gosh, yes. This is why she has to keep opening new shops, right? Uh, they are phenomenal croissants. And Kate has been able to create this brand around Loon uh, because she has been, I think, so dedicated to perfection and to precision and to quality in her pastry making. But that's not really where her career started. You know, she started as a, an aerospace engineer and working in F1, which is an extraordinary career journey. I want to know how that happened. I'm sure you do too. Please welcome Kate Reed. Hi everyone, my name is Kate Reed. As the lovely Jess has introduced, I am the founder and co-owner of Loon Croissantery in Melbourne. Last year added Brisbane and yes, next year it's coming to Sydney. So sorry it's taken so long. <laughs> I thought in the spirit of honesty, I would talk to you about where my career aspirations started. It wasn't the lofty owner of a croissant business and it wasn't even a aerospace engineer working in Formula One. You'll see a photo of me two and a half years old with my dad. I am wearing a green dress covered in clothes pegs. I had the dream to be a Christmas tree. 
I know it sounds pretty wild, but I think maybe I've come a little bit full circle. A Christmas tree brought me so much joy. And at Christmas, I saw how much joy Christmas trees brought everybody. And all I wanted to do was make people happy. So hopefully now making croissants, I'm back on that path. But yeah, we started here. I did realize maybe only a couple of years after this that an inanimate object wasn't an okay career aspiration. So skip to, I think this is maybe 13 or 14 year old Kate. It's the first ever year of the Australian Grand Prix. My dad bought him and I a ticket to go along. He'd been a huge motorsport, mo sorry, motorsport fan his entire life and he wanted me to experience it. So the first ever time I went to the track, it was a cloudy day. I was told to put ear, ear plugs in because uh, there was V10 engines in the F1 cars at the time and the high-pitched squeal of them was pretty much damaging to the eardrum. But I just remember witnessing that for the first time the sound and the speed, and just being like, oh my God, this has to be my life. So from 13 years onwards, I just, with laser focus, picked all my subjects, focused my studies to getting into aerospace engineering with the express purpose of being an aerodynamicist in F1. And it was a really hard slog of 10 years. I think a lot of people at university maybe experience not only the joy of further education and independent education, but also a bit of fun and a bit of partying. But safe to say my five years at university were 40 contact hours a week, get home, study till 3 a.m. in the morning, figure out, keep sending letters to Formula One teams. It was literally dedication. I'd planned out that I think in my career, I wanted to be the first female technical director of a Formula One team. I'd planned out my retirement in Scotland on a lovely farm somewhere. I don't know, I had it all. I saw, I saw my entire life ahead of me. So 10 years later, this is 23-year-old Kate, and I've been offered a job with the Williams F1 team as an aerodynamicist. So yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Pretty wild. I packing up my house to move to the UK. Mum and Dad had given me a book about uh, Damon Hill when he won his world championship in 1996, I think. And I'd written this really embarrassing letter to myself. I can't believe I'm sharing this with you, but I'd written a letter to myself that by the age of 25, I would have achieved a career in F1 and that my dream team was the Williams F1 team. So two years before that, I actually got there. And I think I heard the beautiful Jess talking about this impossibility of knowing what you want when you're 16 or 17 years old. I'm going to expand on that. I think being 13 and deciding what you want as a career and work, working towards it with laser focus, if it's something like Formula One, you can't get work experience in this industry. You're imagining what this job is going to look like. And over a decade of just working dedicatedly towards it, I'd built up a pretty clear and vivid picture of what my day-to-day -day job was going to look like. Safe to say that it was absolutely nothing like that. I think I'm clearly somebody that loves to have a chat. I love working with people, brainstorming, being collaborative, a really dynamic working environment. But by the time I got to Williams, they weren't leading the way, winning world championships anymore. They were very much a mid-pack team. And when you're a mid-pack team working in Formula One, you're not the ones innovating and pushing the industry forward. You're just simply trying to figure out what the, the team at the front is doing. And so it's really playing catch up and it's not a creative collaborative environment. So I found myself on a daily basis in front of a computer for maybe 16 hours a day. I'd show up to work when it was dark, I'd leave when it was dark. I was on a salary of 13,000 pounds a year with the very imminent threat of uh, 3,000 CVs on the HR desk showing up every week. So you know that your seat at your computer is in hot pursuit and if you don't put in the time, effort and dedication, then you're out pretty quickly. So they, they did play on um, a, a fair bit of pressure and I'm a very stubborn person. I don't really like to admit when maybe I've made the wrong decision or I've, you've spent 10 years of your life working towards it, so I ploughed on. I do want to share with you a little story. The first year that I worked in Formula One, I went to the Monaco Grand Prix with my dad and that had been a dream that we'd had for like a decade to do together. But when the Williams team discovered that I was there as a spectator, they called me and said, can you come into the pits? 
They said, you're a girl and you're wearing non-team clothing. No one in the pits will suspect that you're an aerodynamicist because I was literally the only female engineer in the entire company at the time. So they armed me with uh, a large lens digital camera and sent me down the pit lane to take spy photos of the other teams, <laughs> which I thought was so cool at the time, but maybe upon reflection, it was a bit of a backhanded compliment because for nobody to expect that a woman would know what they were looking at, I'm not sure how I feel about that anymore. But anyway, it's a nice little anecdote and a story from my time. But I worked in F1 for almost three years and progressively and progressively became unhappier to the point where undiagnosed, I was definitely suffering from depression and the laser focus that had driven me to a career in Formula One then drove me to another form of control and maybe a bit of obsession and I developed an eating disorder. Became very unwell. It sounds like a sad story, but I think every story hopefully has a silver lining or this one certainly does. When you develop an eating disorder, all you can think about is food. And like, let's be honest, when you're hungry, no one's dreaming about lettuce. I certainly wasn't. Like, my passion, like the thing that I love to eat the most, I've got a shocking sweet tooth. And so I'd think about cakes, biscuits, pastries, whatever. And I started, the only way I could make myself feel happy was I'd end a shockingly long day at work, I'd head home, I'd buy ingredients on the way and I'd bake when I got home. And it brought me an awful lot of joy just engaging with the ingredients and pulling things that otherwise are inedible when they're raw, like butter, sugar, raw eggs. You can't eat them by themselves. But when you pull them together through the science of baking, this amalgamation of the ingredients and the interaction of them creates something that is just so delicious. You pull it out of the oven and the house smells amazing. And then there's the added benefit the next day you take it to work and suddenly you're the favourite person in the office because everyone's so happy with the baked goods that you're bringing in. So got to a point where I really had to make a decision whether I was going to stay very unhappy leading this 16-hour day in front of a computer at work or potentially pursue this other thing that I really loved. So I came back to Australia. I think we're up to that slide now. I was working at a little cafe near my mum and dad's house in Melbourne and making the cakes and tarts. I was lucky that someone had actually given me the opportunity to bake professionally for a living and honestly I couldn't believe my luck and I was kind of back in not making much money again but I was the happiest that I'd ever been and I was loving this but feeling a little bit unchallenged by the type of baking that I was doing so I bought myself a book on French pastry over Amazon arrived home from work one day and it had arrived and this isn't the photo but I randomly opened up the book to a double page spread of pan au chocolat stacked up very much like this. This is a photo from my new book and a nice little, um, yeah, a nice little tie-in. Thanks. <laughs> and I was so mesmerized, like almost hypnotized by this stunning stack of pan au chocolat that I closed the book, walked up to the nearest flight center and I booked myself a ticket to Paris. So. In Paris, a few months later, I thought, well, I can't be in Paris and not go to the place where this photo was taken. So, trekked across Paris to the 10th arrondissement, Canal Saint-Martin, and I walked into the boulangerie and was just awestruck by the beauty of it. Like, not just the beauty of the building, but the counters just covered in these delectable looking pastries and bread. And I went away from that experience so blown away that in a little internet chat room in the hotel I was staying in the next day, I couldn't help but write an email to the owner of the boulangerie telling him how incredible this experience had been for me. Ah, there's a, an actual photo of the boulangerie. And I said to him, look, I know this is very random to ask, but I don't suppose that you would ever consider taking me on as an apprentice. And I reckon within an hour I had a reply for him and he said, oh, we are a very small boulangerie, nobody speaks English here, it would be very difficult and we don't normally do something like this, but I can see the same passion and motivation in you that is in me, when would you like to start? So yeah, very lucky, once again, I found myself on a plane back to Paris six months later to complete what's called a stagiaire. So in the hospitality industry, you typically complete um, a period of unpaid work in, re in return for learning. So I went back to Dupin, I spent a couple of months working in the boulangerie there, learning about the raw pastry of croissant. There I am, baby-faced Kate. <laughs> I think I've got elf ears in that photo sticking out of my hat. So I had this beautiful experience of what a really wonderful croissant could be. And I ended up coming back to Melbourne 
and desperate to find something that was similar to what I'd done, I realise I'm very much running out of time. I'm going to fast track this. Enter Loon. There was nothing like Loon in Melbourne, and I thought, well, I can be the one to do that. But with the little bit of knowledge I'd learnt in Paris, I had to teach myself a lot about the croissant making process. So I imagined that perfect end result, reverse engineered it over the process of about three months, applying, not putting a croissant in a wind tunnel, but using engineering thinking to really critically assess every part of the process. I still want to put it in a wind tunnel. That'd be kind of cool, right? <laughs> so Loon started in a tiny shop in Elwood. My brother joined me 18 months in and helped me turn it into a customer-facing business. He's also been completely intrinsic to the growth of it as an actual business. In 2015, we moved into our beautiful home now in a warehouse in Fitzroy, and this photo was taken for the New York Times when a journalist wrote that he thought we had the best croissant in the world, and that really, really put Loon on the global map. Uh, properly fast forwarding, now I have five stores, three in Melbourne, two in Brisbane and Sydney to come next year. Um, I'm a Porsche ambassador, which is a lovely tie in um, to my original career as an engineer, but um, they're a beautiful brand to work with. And as I mentioned before, I've just finished writing the Loon cookbook. So again, rewriting that recipe of croissants so it's achievable for the home, for the home cook. And um, I'm going to be signing copies of it in Blacksmiths just across the road after this session. Thank so, you so much, Kate. Sorry I overspoke. No, please, round of applause, Kate. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. That was Thanks. really, really wonderful. Thanks. Really wonderful. Thank you, Kate Reed, everybody. Whoa. Now I'm hungry again. Um, that's an amazing story. And, and there's so much courage that you need not, not just to tell the story, but the, those moments where you think about the sunk costs, like all of the work that you did, the 16 hour days, and yet you backed yourself and you trusted your gut and you made the leap to something that would make you happy and makes other people happy too. So extraordinary. And, and you know, that really brings me as well to, to Sam Davey, our next speaker. So Sam uh, is a designer who started his career in London working in agencies when, when being in an agency was the height of cool, you know, in the 90s working, working with, with a lot of different brands. And then then he got the call up to work for a tiny little company called Apple and he, he took the leap at that time and then he took another leap again because he realised and he decided that his passion could contribute to saving the world in, in a really significant way. Um, and, and he backed himself too and his story is a phenomenal story too. So please welcome Sam Davey. Wow, it's just like looking in the mirror. Um, <laughs> hi, uh, I'm Sam Davey. I am the CEO and co-founder of Park. And I'm going to talk to you about my uh, slightly topsy-turvy journey to get to this point. Um, I started out in London, as, um, as the intro said, in the 90s as a graphic designer. I studied graphic design at uni. Um, I was pretty obsessed with typography and found my way into the London design scene in the mid-90s, hence the fashion in this photograph. Um, I think this was, a, there's a little clue in the left-hand corner, I think it, with the word hut. I think it was a German restaurant called Tiroler Hut in West London, I think was where I found myself at this particular uh, uh, early morning uh, session. I'm hoping it was some sort of typographic quiz or something, something nerdy that I was at. Um, but, I think at that time in the design industry, uh, it was a pretty young industry, and I was sort of, at the time, the, the, the entire sort of debate was around how design can be, uh, be effective, shall we say. So it was really the debate around all of these design events and these design conferences was, clients don't know how to commission design. They don't understand the value that design can bring, and the clients basically are idiots, was the general vibe that I was getting from most of this stuff. And I was like, you know what? I don't know whether I subscribe to that. Like, I think that these, you know, our clients kind of know what they're doing. You know, they're running these businesses. They seem to be quite successful. 
You know, they're paying our exorbitant fees. Um, maybe there's more to this. And as a designer, I felt, you know, I kind of had this longing to kind of go to the other side, to go into the business world. I was like, you know, if, if I'm going to learn really what value design can bring on the bigger scale, then I need to go and sit with business. I need to go and sit next to supply chain. I need to go sit next to accounts. I need to go sit next to engineering, whatever it might be, and really kind of do my apprenticeship in terms of like how design can kind of fit into this kind of bigger world. So I left London, and I got an opportunity to move to Coop well, I moved to San Francisco, worked in Cupertino. This is uh, Valley Green Drive 5 which is the, or was, the Apple Design Center in 2001. Uh, so I moved here. I got the opportunity to be a creative director at Apple. And this was, you know, Garamond typefaces, jelly logos, and the sort of birth of the iPod. So it really wasn't the business that it is now. It was, um, you know, a hardware manufacturing company, essentially. Um, but, you know, I felt that, you know, as a designer, if I could learn my trade and learn the value of what design could bring, then this was maybe the one place on the planet that I could do that. And, you know, at the time, you know, kind of going in-house to design was sort of like, it's sort of if you can't cut it in the real world, like go teach, you know, that type of vibe. Um, you know, a lot of my mates were giving me a lot of hassle. They were like, what are you doing? You're working in a cool design agency, like you're in London. And, you know, you're moving to, you know, this weird place called Cupertino. What's all that about? Um, and um, I was like, no, nah, you know what, I've got to go and do this. So I went over, myself and my then girlfriend, now wife, kind of picked ourselves up and kind of moved over to California. And best decision I ever made. Um, it was um, just a phenomenal time. I mean, we, we made some products and we kind of launched some products into the world. It was a great time to be at that business and to learn about how just the place of design and like, you know, the role of design in a business and, and, and what it can do. And you kind of got to be really humble and kind of really sort of do your sort of do your apprenticeship in there. And, you know, you realize that you're in a room with like a ton of like really smart people. And um, you've just got to kind of, you know, shut up, listen, figure out where you can add value. And I think through that process, I learned a lot about, I guess, you know, subliminally what I've kind of brought into my kind of career now. So yeah, we did some stuff, iPod, you probably, maybe some of you have seen that, the audience is quite young. Um, and, um, and then we made this talking device called a phone, and um, I'm sure you've all seen that one. Um, and then I sort of had a bit of an inspirational moment while I was there. This was a, uh, a cover for Time magazine that I art directed with Steve. And um, it's quite apt that they wrote What's Next on the, on the iMac. Um, pretty much right before this, this, we did this uh, photo shoot, Steve turned to me and he said, um, so how can Apple do well by doing good? I was like, uh, not too sure. Um, I'm not too sure what you're asking me. Um, so I kind of, he was like, how can Apple do well by doing good? You know, like, how can it do well for the planet, well for the environment, well for its employees, you know, shareholder, neutral, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, oh, it's a really interesting concept. Did the photo shoot. Um, and kind of this thing just started rattling around in my head about this idea of social impact and, you know, sort of this uh, social enterprise, this gray area between charity and commercial business, essentially. So I kind of got itchy feet. I left Apple. Um, we had a big um, football match, because you'll, you'll see the tie in. It'll come in, in a minute. Um, I'm a bit of a soccer fan. So there's me looking very sweaty and unfit at the bottom. Uh, <laughs> and uh, with a bunch of the people that I'd worked with. And I kind of went off and started um, thinking about what I was going to do next. And at the beginning of all of my projects, I have a notebook that I kind of start, and I kind of just start putting down some thoughts. And I went and dug out in the attic to kind of do this. And I was like raffling through all these notebooks and found the one that I began with Park. And this is what I wrote on the first page. I thought it was quite apt for, I mean, I think especially after seeing, you know, hearing some of the talks this morning, I think this is 
a pretty good um, dynamic to, um, to explore. So I founded Park along with my uh, co-founder, Tara. Uh, Tara and I had worked previously together in another business. Um, and essentially, Park is an impact-driven sportswear brand. And the idea that we had was that we can make a football. For every football we sell, we simply pass one on to a kid or a community or an organization that doesn't have access to the sport. And what value does that bring? You know, so sport for us is a fundamental right. You know, playing and the idea of play is a fundamental right. And we believe that the more people that play and the more people that can access that, the more um, it unlocks uh, human potential, basically, was the idea. And it started out really small. You know, we kind of literally made 3,000 footballs. Tara had a garage in, uh, Tara's based in New York. So we started this thing kind of transcontinental from the beginning, which was just amazing to start off with, where we shipped um, 13, you know, 1,500 balls to her and 1,500 balls to me, and we set up a website, and we put this idea out there that football can change the world, and we kind of went on and um, sort of grew from there, and, you know, we started, you know, working with clubs and communities and leagues and all this sort of stuff, and to this day, it's now sort of spiraling into a fully-fledged sportswear brand where we not only from a social impact perspective that's baked into the footballs at the core of the business, but into um, an environmental um, um, sustainable business as well, where we really are kind of like digging into material science around all the kits and the, the, all the you know, football that we're making in the future. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of work that's going on into that space as well. Um, and fundamentally, it all comes down to, as I said before, um, Park is about um, giving access to play to as many people as possible and really kind of getting into the core roots of what a sportswear brand is all about and what sport is about. In, in, in our opinion, you know, it is about, um, it's about play. And um, so, yeah, it's uh, this idea of a business that can do well by doing good, which was yeah, spawned by a random conversation be before a photo shoot with um, one of the most inspirational people on the planet. Love it. It's a great story. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Please have a seat. So I think what we've already heard is, you know, the way that both of you sort of defied expectation to stay put because you wanted to sort of defy stagnation. You know, you wanted to keep pushing yourselves and you could see that there was something else beyond what you're already doing. Because I think for a lot of people, there's like, you know, you have one goal in mind, you, you throw everything at getting there, and then you figure out, hang on, how long is a career supposed to be? You know, that letter that you wrote at, at 13 is different to when you're 25 and you're actually reflecting back on, on how you feel from that point. Uh, Mary Minnes is someone else who has had a version of this experience. You know, her career sounded incredibly glamorous when we when we hear about it. You know, this is someone who's a film producer, um, you know, who's who's walking the red carpet at Cannes. But she decided that she wanted to dive into something that was deeper, that was closer to her cultural roots, um, and that honoured um, a sense of taking care of yourself uh, and and taking care of other people. And so she's the founder of Sense of Self Bathhouse in Melbourne. And please welcome Mary Minas. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Hi, everyone. My name's Mary, and I'm one half of Sense of Self, which is a bathhouse in Melbourne. Um, so very far from tech, bear with me. Um, so here I am. There's little Mary. Uh, little Mary had big dreams. Uh, in primary school, I announced to uh, my uh, peers in, in the schoolyard that I wanted to be a singer slash lawyer. And <laughs> I mean, what's, what kind of a combination is that anyway? Um, I mean, I, and what they said to me was that I couldn't do it, uh, which was 
kind of confusing to me because mum always told me that I could do whatever I set my mind to and dad told me to do uh, whatever made me happy. So um, I think reflecting on it now, what they were telling me was that you couldn't, you had to choose one thing. You couldn't do all things. You had to, couldn't be diverse. And I guess I'm here to tell you that that's not true and that, you know, I've had a really fulfilling uh, couple of careers, which I'm going to tell you about. So, um, as just said, I was a filmmaker before this, um, so I guess somewhere between being on the stage and litigating. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I had a great career for 10 years. I got to produce films, documentaries, um, work on short films, commercials, and here is a, a crew, cast and crew shot of us um, uh, at the on the feature film that I made uh, in uh, 2013, and uh, that was when I was 26, so there's me there. And uh, directly next to me is actually my co-producer, John Maynard, who's standing up there on the left with the glasses, who's actually here today because he has his offices here at Carriage Work, so it's really lovely to have John here, who's been a real mentor in my life and who I probably spoke to when I was looking to change careers as well. Um, so, anyway, film was an incredible journey, uh, but what happened for me was that I had a significant life event that was going on during this time. Um, whilst we were producing the film, um, my dad got diagnosed with gallbladder cancer, and, you know, so when I wasn't uh, on set, when I wasn't um, in the cutting room or we were releasing the film, I was really looking after George um, a lot of that time. And I think when you have that experience, again, there are silver linings to, to tragedy, which is that you kind of become really honest with yourself, um, you know, blazingly honest. And I had to get really honest about the fact that I was ready to move out of film, you know. It wasn't giving me the same passion anymore. I wasn't completely creatively fulfilled in, in the role that I was in. Um, and I could see other things that I might want to do. Um, so... What that led me to was to dig deeper and think, OK, well, what do I want to do? So I was seeking opinions, seeking some help from different people, um, and I went and saw a life coach. And it was pretty rubbish, actually. But um, <laughs> she did give me one thing, which was this thing called 40 things that would blow your mind. And I'm like not really into um, goals because it's a bit rigid for me. But this idea of like what would blow my mind to do in my life, and like 40 is a good number because it's like you have to really think about what are the 40 things I would do. Um, and one of the things that I put down was that I would love to open a bathhouse. Um, and, okay, why bathing? I mean, I, uh, it's totally random. Um, <laughs> but the reason was because I'd had an experience when I was a really young woman, um, when I was with a friend in Paris, and she's French Tunisian, and she had taken me to the hammam. I thought it would be about one hour. It turned out to be six. We were there. We got to spend time together. The connection that we made in that time, but also the the kind of a view that I got um, of the spectrum of bodies that was around me in that space, it's just, it's unprecedented. It's nothing that I'd ever seen before in my life. And to be able to place myself as somebody who had probably struggled with body issues, as a lot of us have um, through my teenage years, to place myself as just one person within that spectrum of bodies was the most neutralising thing I had ever experienced. And it was just, it was like a weight off. So I, I had this thing in the back of my head and I had become interested in the history of bathing. So I started to look into these things at any chance I could or visit places whenever I could. Um, so I thought, OK, well, why don't I go? And because I was being a bit ginger about it, I was like, why don't I make a doco about bathing through the ages? And I'll take my camera along and I'll gather some research. And so that's what I did. So I took four months off and I went around the world and I saw two, four, eight, 46 bathhouses um, on my trip. And it was, it was incredible. I learned all about the different cultures, about the different rituals, and I just got so inspired. And I think what um, for me was happening was I was coming to terms with the fact that actually I didn't really want to make a doco. I, I actually wanted to make a business and I wanted to bring it to life in Melbourne. Um, so, I, yeah, but I got to see beautiful places around the world. This is Therme Vells in Switzerland, probably known as the best bathhouse in the world. Um, this is in Japan, in Kyushu, uh, in Morocco, uh, in Japan again. Um, 
But all good stories, you know, have little curveballs to them. Um, and actually, when I was on my travels, I ran into another colleague um, who was at the Cannes Film Festival and told me, hey, stop in, come and, you know, hang out. And uh, she said to me, hey, actually, I've got the people from Ridley Scott's company here. <laughs> and I don't know if you know Ridley Scott, but he's the director of Alien, Prometheus, The Martian, a pretty big deal in the film world. <laughs> and basically, she said, we're actually looking for someone to come and work with us to do a professional development in our London office in the film department, which is like, that's like a dream job to anybody um, in film um, who's a producer. So, you know, like even though I already had this passion, I, uh, I thought, well, fuck it, basically. I gotta go. <laughs> the carrot was dangled, I was like totally in. So I actually ended up flying home and then flying back to London to stay with them for the next eight months. Um, but what that really cemented for me was, um, oh, this is our offices in Scott Free. That's a little Thelma and Louise poster in the background. Um, so, yeah, what it cemented for me was that I was actually already out the door and I was ready to start the next journey, which um, led me to coming back to Australia. And although I had um, all these ideas and exuberance um, and, and some ideas about business modelling, I think I didn't really know how to put it together into a formal business. So I went back to school and studied entrepreneurship and I met my co-founder, Freya Berrick, who's also here today. And, you know, Freya and I really connected over the, the idea of true hospitality. You know, Freya comes from a background of, of being a chef and creating experiences for people and hotel curation. Um, and I'm Greek, so basically we like to welcome any stranger from anywhere <laughs> into the home. Um, it was a natural it was a natural team. So basically, I'll, I'll get through the next few parts pretty quickly because I know we want to get to the panel, but um, the essence of it was that the next few years were pretty tough. You know, we were being told constantly that we couldn't do what we wanted to do. You know, making a bathhouse isn't like an MVP type thing. You can't, <laughs> you can't like put 20 grand into it. You have to raise a whole lot of money. And we didn't know how the hell we were going to do that. Uh, so we had to kind of go deep into the values of what we were doing. We didn't have anything. We didn't have a site. We didn't have money. We had nothing. So we had to start telling the story of why we were doing this, which was all about social connection, bringing people together and, you know, neutralizing people's body image and making them have a good time in a wellness space not like they had to go and change themselves. So, uh, basically, cut to us signing a lease when we didn't have anything. Um, so, we, we used that as a launching pad to put a lot of PR out and tell people, hey, we're opening. Um, had nothing at that point. Signed up for 150 customers, had 1,500 um, 1, on a waiting list, waiting to get in, and uh, then we could go to investors and say, hey, we've actually got proof here. I mean, it was pretty gutsy because, um, you know, we had a lot on the line at that point. Um, and it got even more nerve-wracking because uh, in uh, the next year, 2020, we had a pandemic and we lost some investment because people got nervous and we were staring at a pile of dirt. Um, so we had to really double down and go back to those investors that, um, that believed in us and, and put more in ourselves. And it was hard, but we got there. So this is Sense of Self today. It's in Melbourne in Collingwood, and I'll just show you a few images. Um, we call it Mediterranean Brutalist style, which is something we made up. Um, and, <laughs> and we really pride ourselves on, um, you know, the, what... what you see in the imagery is the people you see in the space. And, you know, it's really important to us. So I think, you know, in terms of changing career, I think you need to have a little vision, um, a little fear. Um, you need to have the guts. Um, and also, you need to have people that will shit you enough um, and tell you you're crazy um, to make you do it anyway. So that's about it. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Wow. Such amazing careers. We, there's so much there, and um, I, I've, I've only got time for one question, maybe two, if I can really sneak them in. But uh, uh, look, I, I wanted to talk really quickly about overcoming that internal and external critic, right? So, so Sam, I'm sure people thought you were bonkers to, to leave Apple and start your own thing. People probably thought you were bonkers at the beginning. How do you overcome that internal critic and the external critics? I think you've just got to, you've just got to have real faith. In your, I mean, a kind of blind faith, really. Blind faith. Sometimes in like your own abilities. Like no one's going to believe in you unless you believe in yourself, really. So it's just that case of just, yeah, just 
just being a bit bullheaded and kind of going for it, I think. You and know? trusting your gut. Yeah, trusting your gut. Yeah. Just like, you know, there's always going to be people that tell you that you're crazy. And, but, you know, the people that maybe know you best will back you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the people who think you're crazy are on the waiting list to get into Sense of Self right. at the moment. Because Kate was saying earlier that she was trying to get in, but there's just no chance. Or at the back of the croissant line. <laughs> or in the queue for the croissant line, you know, like everybody else. Um, just quickly, you know, we talked as well about how, uh, you know, there's this r r rush for talent right now and there's not enough people out there, but there's all of these people. Do you think your diverse spectrum of life experience has helped you be more open-minded to bringing new talent into your own businesses? Yeah. Rick and Mary. Yeah, I think absolutely. Like, I think, you know, we um, we definitely look outside of the box, but we've also been influenced. Like, I, I guess I skipped one part, which is that Freya and I have come through a bit of a tech um, a trajectory before we got fully into the business. We had to work some jobs to uh, sustain ourselves. So I was working for an accelerator, so was Freya. And I guess um, we were exposed to great training with regards to diversity and, in and inclusion in tech. And that was amazing through Launch Vic, um, which has... Um, told us that there was heaps of data around people not needing university degrees to be as effective as the, um, those counterparts who did. Um, it was about a four-month um, lapse in terms of coming up to speed in some cases. I don't know if that's for all. Mm. Um, all jobs. So that's really something I mean, that, that people can take away from this is actually trust your gut on backing people, right? Would you say that as well, Kate? Yeah, of course. I think hospitality is... It's, a, it's an interesting field to be in at the moment. Like, I'm sure with, I've heard of many other industries, but it's incredibly hard to staff. And I think flipping that, it's taught us that if we want to get the best people and attract those that are talented and, and forward thinking, we have to be a preferred employer. So it's really pushing us as a hospitality business to... Like, we have an amazing maternity program that is far beyond most industries. I think we've got an em employee um, mental health program where employees can confidentially come to their manager and we will pay for psychology sessions for them. Um, we've introduced better award levels than most other hospitality businesses, including multi-levels between the normal hospitality awards. And I think just making yourself a preferred workplace. Like if you create somewhere that you'd want to work and that you feel really valued and trusted, I think it gives you the opportunity to get really good people in. Mm. I think that's not an exact answer to your question. No, but, like, but I think that's, that's it. It's being open and meeting people where they are and creating the conditions for everybody to thrive and to, to contribute, you know. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Sam, I was looking at the date on that time cover, and I think it was like 2005, 2006. What's it? <laughs> around then. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> I, um, I, I, was, I remember that year too. But um, the, the thing that was interesting to me about it was that, you know, back then, not everyone was having the conversation about, you know, making, doing well by doing good. Like now that's a, a popular conversation and the Purpose Crew are here in the, in the second row. And like, you know, this is something that more and more businesses and particularly in, in the tech world know that that's an expectation. How has that been fundamental to your journey, do you think, in, in, in creating play? I'm well, sorry, creating Park. Oh, I mean, absolutely integral, really. I mean, I just had no, uh, that, before that conversation, I had no concept that that was even a thing, mm. like to think about a business doing that. I, my, my head just wasn't even in that mindset. Um, I mean, it wasn't in a mindset of actually earning or running a business, you know? So, I mean, to kind of, it just, I think just that one conversation just kind of totally flipped me over to a different way of thinking. And I mean, yeah, you're right. Like, I mean, you know, Steve was pretty smart. He <laughs> was, was pretty early on that point. And, um, you know, and I think that, um, I was, yeah, just, I think, l lucky enough to kind of be the person that he asked the question to, mm. you know, because it kind of just puts you I know, on, that, on that path. And, you know, it took a while to kind of percolate it around, but you kind of get to the point where you're like, okay, I can take that, I can take that, I can take these skills that I've got and this passion that I have, and you can kind of pin it all together and go, right, there's a, okay, there's a, there's a need, there's a, there's a desire, there's a market, there's a... You know, there's an opportunity there. Let's go and do it. You know, and that's kind of, I guess, you know, what we all do really. Are just kind of seeing that opportunity and wrapping our passion around it and backing yourself. You know, and and I think you know, in the kind of 12 careers that the four of us have had, you know, on on stage, 
I think the through line seems to be passion, right? And it mm. seems to be that everyone here backed the thing that they did when they got home after the long day that they were doing when they were kind of off duty at the supposedly dream job. Mm. Uh, they were, that was the bit where you were like, well, what if I shift my focus and this level of intensity and focus to the thing I love? Um, so if you had one thing, now that we're dramatically over time, if you had one thing that you could say to people who are contemplating that kind of leap for themselves, what do you think it would be? I'll start with you, Kate. I think you've touched on it, you need the passion, but you also just really need to graft. Like, nothing good, you don't, don't change career if you just want to sit back on the couch and expect it all to happen. Like. I think none of it felt like hard work to me because I was passionate about it and I'm sure that Sam and Mary would say the same thing. But like it's incredibly hard work, especially when you've got an idea that maybe somebody else hasn't had before. And I think like looking at both of these two, mm. they had ideas that nobody else had done before and it takes yourself believing in it and then an incredibly large amount of work to get it off the ground, but it's so rewarding when you finally do. So mm. I think you look back on it with a lot of pride and, and gratitude in yourself that, that you gave it a go. Mm. That's fantastic. What do you think, Sam? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, you know, passion is universal, essentially. Like, we can all have it. You know, we all have it in something. I think that opportunity is the non-universal component of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, when you're starting something, I think if you've got the opportunity to do it, like, don't waste it. Like, you yeah. know, like, it's a really precious thing. And whether that's time or money or resources or skills or whatever it might be, but just give it a crack, you know? Like, I just feel as though not everybody has that opportunity. Yeah. If you yeah. get it, grab it. Thank you. What about you, Mary? Uh, I'd probably say lean into the fear. Like, you can, you can really easily discount yourself. Um, you know, you do at different times. You, you, you sometimes are a believer, sometimes you're not. You know, you have good days and bad. But it's like lean into the fear. Just, just, just go for it and, and try and get people around you that, that are real supporters. That's fantastic. That's really wonderful advice for anyone who's thinking about making a big leap, leap or trying something new or even looking for talent at the moment, something else to take away. Please give these guys a big round of applause.